Hello, 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 beautiful people of the YouTube world and via podcast. If you're listening just via the ear holes, we have uh, adapted the quad box sphere here. Uh, this is what we did all NFL draft weekend. So if you guys hung out with us for the live stream, thank you for that. We, we very much appreciate it. I'm not sure why you would do that, but we had a lot of fun, at least on our side. So we're going to stick with the quad box. And I feel like this is a better template going forward. Now that the NFL draft is done, it's time to actually, you know, like we, we spend so much time talking about the rookies and stuff and we have a rookie drafts and whatever, but it's time to actually start gearing towards the fantasy season, right? Like we're actually starting to pick players on our teams and make real tangible moves and shit. So rookie drafts are here. Everyone's going to have theirs within the next week or two weeks or three weeks, whatever it may be for your specific league. Today, we're going to do a mock draft, right? The NFL draft is done. So we know where the rookies landed now. With the rookie drafts coming up, we want to help y'all prepare. Make sure you don't fuck up and take, you know, Jonathan Taylor at the 101 when CEH is sitting there, right? We don't we don't want to do that now. So we're going to do a rookie mock draft here. We're going to do the first uh, round, first full round, so 12 picks, which is super flex. We're going to keep the second, third, and fourth round in the draft guide. So if you are a draft guide buyer already, you get the exclusive rounds two through four as well. Uh, if not, you still get a good probably hour of analysis of the first round of a rookie mock draft and uh i realized that i never never ever mentioned that this is bunk bed breakdown so that is the name of this podcast by the way bunk bed breakdowns despite us being devoid of any bunk bunk beds in the uh in the picture how are we doing boys i'm doing so well the draft like actually happened we were speculating that it wouldn't and we just stared at a computer for about 20 hours over three days but it was worth it it was worth i'm it. doing yeah it's fucking awesome man like i i'm in the middle of two rookie drafts right now like to start early um so yeah i mean it's it's freaking i'm pumped dude yeah a lot of good draft picks Ex exciting times to pretend to want to be alive so we're gonna do <laughs> one pick at a time super flex and we will go back probably at the end of it and discuss you know if you're in a one quarterback league how that would differentiate where you're picking guys like burrow and Tua, whatever 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 we play a lot of super flex so we're gonna do super flex the player analysis will be the same regardless of what type of uh format y'all are drafting in so I hope y'all enjoy. If you do, make sure you smash that thumbs up at the end of the video or the beginning or the middle. I don't give a shit, whatever it is. Subscribe to the channel if you're new. This is Bunk Bad Breakdown. Stop yelling. Tuck your shirts in. Hit the fucking intro. Quick commercial break. Forgot to tell you that our Discord channel is bike and open to the public. See, Corona has shut this shit down. Movie theaters and libraries. Nobody fucking goes to libraries anymore, but y'all get the point. We are open for you guys. Our Discord channel will be back and open freely to everybody. We uh, close it down once we hit a thousand people and we said Patreons only from now on, but y'all could always sign up and support us, patreon.com slash BDGE, but it's back and open to the public. So if you want to jump in there, our Discord channel is, you know, it's all Dynasty talk, talk all the time. It's trade offers. It's uh, how you join Big Dog's Dynasty Leagues if you're dying to get into one. Um, so this is completely free and it's just people in our audience that want to talk football 24 seven. It's a fucking awesome resource, always popping. Uh, so join it. We will link that down below as well as clipped commented in the top of the comment section. Love y'all. All right, so how we're going to do this, one pick at a time. We're going to work it as like a snake draft in a sense. So I'm going to go with the 101. I believe Noah has the 102. Mike has the 103 and 104, and then we'll work its way back that way. Y'all know what a fucking snake draft is. You play fantasy football. So with the 101. Now, I, I've, I've been an advocate of taking Clyde Edwards Hilaire at the 101. As soon as the first round ended, I was like, there's not really a way that I see someone jumping above him. Then the Colts did take Jonathan Taylor you know, like uh, nine picks later or whatever it was. And it definitely made it a decision, but I'm going to stick with my gut here. I'm going to stick with Clyde Edwards Hilaire. I talked about it pretty uh, in depth in yesterday's video, which is breaking down my top rookies for uh, the 2020 fantasy football season. I just don't think it's that difficult of, you know, you can't go wrong. Here's, here's what I'll say. Like the 101, it's a tier of Taylor. It's a tier of Clyde Edwards Hilaire. Unless you're extremely desperate for a quarterback, then you could argue the case for a borrower or two or whoever you like. But with Clyde, man, I first round draft capital, the kid is is way better than he's getting credit for as a running back. I know people just keep citing like he's small, he's five seven, whatever. Ninetieth percentile BMI. The kid can stay on the field. The kid is big enough to have a big, big workload. Like you don't draft someone. People people think he's gonna come in and just be like a between the twenties 
tackle guy and like catch a few passes. I'm like, you understand that th- he's going to get over 250 touches in in his first rookie season with Pat Mahomes as a quarterback. He's scoring double digit touchdowns probably and catching 60 passes, probably 60 60 passes a year because that's what happens when you're in an Andy Reid offense and he displays he thinks he's Brian Westbrook he thinks he's the next Brian Westbrook pretty much right that's what we're, we're hearing from the Andy Reid camp and that's how they're going to play this kid so CH I just don't think you need to look too far past uh the, the team that he fell to it wasn't like he was a third round pick and you're reaching for it because you're like oh he's a Kansas City running back right first round draft capital first running back off the board there's a reason Joe Burrow came out and said he's the best player I've ever played with there's a reason why they asked Patrick Mahomes and Patrick Mahomes was like I want Clyde. There's a reason they didn't take Jonathan Taylor. That is kind of my argument. I'm just going to stick with CEH. Don't think you can go wrong either way, though. Yeah, and if he wasn't good, he wouldn't be such a big part of the LSU offense last year. Mike brought it up a bunch of times, but they have a young guy named John Emery. I believe you said he was like the number one recruit coming into college this year. And CEH pushed him aside. He was dominant in the receiving game. He was dominant on the goal line. The score, The guy scored a ton of touchdowns, no matter who was up against him, against Alabama in the national championship game. Then he goes in the first round, and he's on a Chiefs team. That made Damian Williams basically like a second or third round pick in redraft last year, despite us not really knowing if he's good at football. Now, CEH, sure, he's not the athlete that Damian Williams is, but he does everything else much better than him. And if I'm drafting in rookie drafts and you can get a guy that you can almost guarantee 65 to 70 receptions in that offense, who's probably going to get goal line work despite not being tall, which I don't understand why that matters. (laughs) uh, You can't really pass up, but I do agree. It's kind of a tier of two. And it's personal preference. And on the live stream, I kind of brought it up. It's like deciding between Alvin Kamara and Ezekiel Elliott in, in startup drafts because you can either go with what you perceive to be the floor out of the rushing game you get with Zeke or JT or the receiving game, which you get out of uh, Clyde Edwards-Alaire or Alvin Kamara. So it's personal preference. I don't think you can really go wrong with either. I also think Clyde has like a, a very uh, Christian McCaffrey-esque production coming his way in the NFL. Uh, probably a lighter version of it, but how like C-Mac goes 1,000 for 1,000. I could see, you know, Clyde going 800 and 800 or 750 and 750. And that means if he's getting 750 through the air, he's catching probably 75 to 85 balls, right? There, there was a, a great stat from, from Nate List on the Road Underworld podcast. Under Andy Reid, Andy Reid has had five separate running backs targeted 100 times in a season before. Five separate running backs have had over 100 targets in a season. Like, Clyde is going to see that at least once during his rookie contract. Like, I can't overstate like how involved in the passing game he's going to be. And, and yes, he's smaller on the goal line. Again, like good coaches don't need you to be tall, don't need you to be fat to be the goal line guy. <laughs> the ones who got the best eyes, the best vision, the best balance are the ones who are going to get into the end zone, and those are the ones who are going to be on the field within the five-yard line. So 101 CEH, smack it down. Look, I mean, here, here's the only argument you need to say. Who was the RB4 last year in PPR? Hopefully not Derrick Henry. I'll guess Aaron Jones. Austin Eckler. Austin Eckler was on a much more inferior uh, offense, we would agree, right? Led by Philip Rivers, uh, kind of occupying that same role. Nope. And, you know, he he's someone where, like, you know, obviously a lot of destruction came without Melvin Gordon, but let's be honest, there's no Melvin Gordon on the Chiefs. The Chiefs are going to score a lot more. And like you said, man, CEH is going to get the groundwork. So it's not like he's just some, like, scat back. Yeah, he's yeah and two more points that. just carrying off of what Nick said. He was picked in the first round, so he gets that fifth-year option to stay on the Chiefs as well, which I'd imagine where they drafted him, the player that he is. Hopefully he gets exercised. And number two, as for goal line work, Damian Williams had the third most goal line carries on that offense last year behind Daryl fucking Williams and LaShawn McCoy. So he's <laughs> he just not the goal line back though, there. In fairness. Yes. Well, I mean, LaShawn McCoy was like not playing half the games he was in either. I, but I, think, still, the, like, I think the point of it is, it's not like Damian Williams is like the clear goal line back here. It's not like Mark Ingram yeah. or something like that, where you know he's getting the fucking carries down there. No, you, got, you guys forgot about Darwin Thompson. The guy's got mad quads. Dude, I love that. When, when people are like, oh, Clyde is my 101, and then you always see in the comment section, like, yeah, that worked out good for Darwin Thompson. It's like, Darwin <laughs> Thompson was like a fucking sixth-round pick or seventh-round pick, whatever he was. You're, I hate everybody on Twitter, yo. <laughs> All right, move on, 102. Make my fucking 102, pick. we're going with Jonathan Taylor, kind of in that same tier. And on stream, Ray kind of brought it up that these guys both fell into very similar situations that they had in college, right? Wisconsin is a team that isn't great at passing the ball, but they are very good with their offensive line and very good at running the ball. That's what Indy is. Indy has a fantastic offensive line. Jonathan Taylor is going to fit there perfectly. I was looking at Graham Barfield's Yards Created uh, article that he put up, and 87% of Jonathan Taylor's rushes went straight up the middle. Well, Indianapolis, their offensive line ranks 12th in adjusted line yards on runs up the middle. And that was with Marlon Mack there. Imagine Marlon Mack plus 25 pounds and then shave off 0.1 on his 40-yard dash. And that's what you get out of Jonathan Taylor. 
And last year, Marlon Mack was actually fed the ball a ton. He never really stays healthy, but he was on pace for over 1,250 rushing yards and easily over 250 carries. Not that Jonathan Taylor is going to step in and see like 300 touches his rookie year, but I could easily see like 250 and him going for 1,200, 1,300 yards, similar to like a back half of what Nick Chubb saw in his rookie year. And on top of that, if you are worried at all about Jonathan Taylor not being good, even if you think that he's not good at football, Jonathan Williams came into the fold last year, halfway through the season. He was barely even on any type of team before then. And he, he broke free for like 200 yards over two games. So even if you think Jonathan Taylor isn't good, I don't this think situation is that. way too good to pass up Have on. you seen anyone on Twitter? If you haven't seen that on Twitter, then it's not a reasonable argument. I know, but it's like a worst case scenario. And most reasonable case is Jonathan Taylor rushes for 1,200 yards and leads all rookies in rushing. And I don't expect a lot of receiving work. The narrative is that Phil Rivers wants to throw to his running backs a lot. He's also had like Austin Eckler, Danny Woodhead, Darren Sproles, and a bunch of guys that can catch passes. So if Jonathan Taylor comes away with 25 receptions, that's a win in my books, even though we've heard from a sharp that uh, Marlon Mack's going to catch like 29 plus. But <laughs> Did you see, I don't uh, think he can go did you see uh, Evan Silva tweet out? Animal's really pumped up about it. He's like, I wonder if the drafting of Jonathan Taylor makes Marlon Mack uh, push into a more receiving type uh, <laughs> thing. And Animal was so pumped up about it because Animal thinks that he's catching over 28 and a half passes. So I'm pretty sure I haven't looked at the numbers, but I'm pretty sure that would be like his. Uh, I don't even know if he's caught 28 passes in his career yet. Marlon Mack. <laughs> he caught 31 over the past two years combined. Okay, that's so. what I thought. Yeah, something ridiculous like that. OK, so Jonathan Taylor. Yeah, I mean, one on two is no arguing that. I, again, like if you have the one on one. What I would what I would do is try to trade back to the 102, pick up an extra second round something. You know, if someone has someone's really high on Taylor or something, you can move back one spot and pick up an extra pick. Like that's what I would do because these two are are absolutely in a tier uh, of their own. Yep, yep. All right, next up, I'm gonna go with uh, Joe Burrow here at the 103. Reminder: This is super flex. Um, so like, kind of like what you said, I think the tier one cutoff is pretty clear for me in terms of JT and Clyde Edwards Alaire. So after that, I'm, I'm going to go to my tier one QBs and that's going to be Joe Burrow and Tua back to back. Um, I just got Tua in a rookie mock at 104. So I was super happy about that because I was desperate for quarterbacks. Um, and you know, we, we always tell you to like go running back first, but that like, for me, it's like about a tier break. So the tier break for me is after JT. So that's why I'm going with the two quarterbacks here. And even if you have a lot of quarterbacks, you can always trade quarterbacks. Like they're probably one of the easiest assets to trade. And if you're the person that has three or four starting ones, you're like the only one that can give one up without getting one in return. Yeah. The, the other thing I love about the Joe Burrow pick is like at the end of the day, to win fantasy football leagues, like you just need good players on your team, right? There's, there's sense in making risky picks and there's sense in always shooting for upside. But like a Burrow here seems so safe. It seems like one of the more safe picks we've had in almost years. Like I almost feel like, you know, quarterbacks that come out each year, some of them have a little bit of risk to them and you feel weird taking them. Burrow just seems like the safest play we've had in a long time. And you know, he's just going to anchor your fantasy team for a very long time. So pick good players on your team and your team will eventually be good. Yeah, and a big reason why Joe Burrow is so good isn't even just his arm. This guy can run the ball pretty well. I know we didn't see him run a 40, but... There's that famous play where he beats Isaiah Simmons to the edge, who's like a freak of nature and ran a 4-3-9. Joe Burrow's not running a 4-3-9, but he has enough speed to add points on the ground. Like, Blake Bortles ran like a 4-9, and he was giving you 30 to 40 rushing yards a game. Joe Burrow in college put up 368 and 399 rushing yards over his past two years. His per-game rushing numbers were at 27.4. Russell Wilson in college was at 28.42. So he brings a very similar type of level of rushing upside in the league. They also added T. Higgins to replace A.J. Green, so they're building around him, along with having John Ross and Tyler Boyd there. Jonah Williams coming back. I think Billy Price is still there. They spent a first-round pick on him. So although it's the Bengals and you never want to really invest in one of their players, uh, it, it does look to be like a good situation for fantasy purposes. Yeah. God. Yo, did you guys notice this uh, player profiler as Joe Burrow's best comparable is Jameis Winston? Really? Oh, that's disgusting. Yeah. That makes no sense. Uh, was he a late breakout too, Winston? Uh, I don't remember what he did in college. He was a stud in college at FSU. He's a baller. Well, I remember. Uh, no, he's an early breakout. He was a 19 year old breakout. Interesting. I wonder why they early had that breakout comp. inaccurate guy that can't run. <laughs> he's very Great accurate. Comp. He always hits somebody. <laughs> Paul never hits the fucking. Floor. He's hit a ton of Saints receivers in his career. That was a, that was a, a, right. a great tweet. <laughs> All 
Uh, I'm back up at the 105, and I'm going to go with J.K. Dobbins here. Now, he's not somebody who I Wait, fully I'm sorry expect to cut to. you up. Mike, you took both quarterbacks, Burrow and Tua? Yeah. Okay. okay. Yeah, Burrow and Tua. Gotcha. So at the 105, I'm going J.K. Dobbins. He's not somebody I expect to really break out in his rookie year. He is behind Mark Ingram, but uh, if you look into his contract, he can be cut for a very small amount next year. I think it's $1.3 million. And I would say, aside from Clyde Edwards-Alaire, as good as JT's landing spot was, I think this was the most beneficial of any running back in this class because you look at his college production, he had a huge freshman season, a big dip his second year, and then he went for over 2K in his junior year. And you look at what may have caused this, the big discrepancy is in his jun- in his sophomore season, he was playing with Dwayne Haskins. The other two years, he was playing with mobile quarterbacks. This past year was with uh, Justin Fields. He goes to basically the best version of Justin Fields in the NFL. And sure, he'll be behind Mark Ingram. But if you could if you could guarantee me that Mark Ingram would be gone by next year, I wouldn't be so sure that I would take Joe Burrow ahead of him. I think that situation is just way too good to pass up on. You may have to wait on it a bit. But I mean, you don't draft a guy in the second round for him to sit behind a 30 year old running back for two years. I think they're going to try to force his hand and try to get him involved and like worst case scenario, Gus Edwards ran for over 700 yards these past two years. He's going to get some work. He might not be a viable starter for you in the beginning of the season, but I think we could see a very Miles Sanders-esque uh, pace this year where as the season progresses, he starts to get more and more work, and you don't have to get a ton of volume in that offense to produce. Mark Ingram was seeing like 13 and a half rushes a game and was a top 10 running back. So I'm going with J.K. Dobbins there. I think he's just too good of a talent and too good of a situation to really let you down at the 105. Yeah, I think uh, obviously tempers need to be – um, geared down a little bit for redraft, but like J.K. Dobbins in terms of like future prospects, he's gonna be behind Lamar Jackson for his entire rookie contract, which is fucking beautiful. Like Mark Ingram was, don't get don't get me wrong, fantastic last year, but he's like 31 years old and he just averaged five yards per carry. He just basically had a career year, like he just resurrected himself. So imagine what an explosive J.K. Dobbins can do. Like one of the most athletic running backs. We didn't get to see the combine, obviously, but from everything you've heard about his testing prior. Imagine putting him with those holes in Baltimore's offensive line and just the holes that he gets from playing with Lamar Jackson. And they're, you know, they're revamping their receiving core, too. So there's more weapon. Like Mark Ingram did that while all they had on the outside was like Marquise Brown and Andrews over the middle. Now they have Duvernay. Now they've been, you know, kind of building a little bit of a weapon core there in Baltimore. So it's like this offense can only get better and better and better and more efficient, especially on the ground. This is the most like run heavy team in the NFL that we've seen in a, in a long time. I don't imagine them stopping anytime soon. So Dobbins future outlook is absolutely fantastic. So 105 can't argue. 106 gets a little dicey here. Uh, I, I'm definitely kind of torn between the two running backs that are left in um, Swift and Akers. And I realize I have both picks, but I think it's important to kind of harp on like which one you would take first here. Cause that's going to be a decision for a lot of people. I think uh, I, I think I might end up going with Akers here because he has the clearest, past, clearest path to touches immediately out of the gate. The way I look at it is like the Rams had a lot of fucking holes, right? A lot of holes in their offensive line that weren't making holes. And they had their first pick in the second round they used on Cam Akers. They thought that the most important thing to shore up with the first pick that they had in this draft was the running back position, which should tell you everything you need to know about how they feel about the Real Henderson. And it should also tell you how high they are on a guy like Cam Akers. So we look at the girly role and listen, the girly role is not what the girly role once was. They don't have the line last year. They threw to the fucking running backs at a clip of 10%, which was the low. That was lower than even Lamar Jackson. I think Lamar was at 11%. The Rams were at 10%. And I think that's what we're going to continue to see as they go more two tight end sets without Cooks, right? It's going to be a lot of Cup. It's going to be a lot of uh, Robert Woods on the outside with the tight ends up the middle. So I think it's going to be very run heavy. They're going to try to go with a lot of running, not too much passing to the to the running back. But he is far more explosive than Todd Gurley is at this point in his career. And I think he adds that element back to the offense that they didn't have before. So in terms of these running backs, I wouldn't be surprised. Like if I'm looking at redraft, I would say it's Clyde Edwards and then I think it's a coin flip for who produces more in their rookie season. Fantasy points between Cam Akers and Jonathan Taylor. So with that said, over the next, you know, two years, if they can improve their offensive line one way or another, I know they did a a horrible job of addressing it now, but uh, we'll, we'll bank on the team that was able to put together a roster to get them to the Super Bowl really quickly, that they could do it again, that they could put together an offensive line that helps them win games and helps Cam Akers be better. Right? He's a guy that came from Florida State. Off a horrible offensive line goes to the Rams, who have been a very bad offensive line since the beginning of last year. Um, I think he can capitalize. He's just super talented, and I think he goes right into a role where he'll see as much volume as any rookie running back. 
Yeah, I think uh, out of everyone, I think even including Jonathan Taylor and Clyde Abuzolaire, I'd say that Cam Akers probably has the most clear path to like a workhorse role, assuming he's good enough. Because if you look about like everywhere else, right? Like Jonathan Taylor has to deal with Naheem Hines and Marlon Mack, obviously. And Clyde Edwards O'Leary has to deal with Damian Williams. He's going to have the bulk of the work, but he's going to have to deal with Damian Williams. And then J.K. Dobbins obviously has the most roadblocks with Mark Ingram there. Uh, the, the thing with Akers is it's just weird, right? Because Les Need, I've been saying this for so long, is like probably the most irresponsible GM there is in the NFL that's not named Bob. Disrespectful. Uh, Billy OB. Yeah. Because like he, there were so many needs they had, and in the second round they decided to draft Cam Akers, who I love, right? But they decided to draft Cam Akers as a running back, and they drafted Van Jefferson, who they could have got probably two rounds later. So it's like it's bad because they did not address the biggest need, which was the O line. But it's good because if you look at the prototype for the running back that would succeed there, it's probably someone like Cam Akers. I think the only worry with him is. He's a development project. We kind of said this like from the very beginning. He's super raw. He doesn't have the best patience, not the best reads uh, at the line of scrimmage, but he has the athleticism to kind of beat a lot of people. So I think it's going to be, I think he's more going to be like that Miles Sanders prototype where same thing, like Miles Sanders was not at all refined as a runner when he first came in the league and he just like drastically improved throughout the end of the season. So I think we can see something, something like that. I also think we could see something like Joe Mixon where we're really excited about the athleticism. Yep. And we don't, you know, he might not put it together for, for a while because Cincinnati, you know, they had that shitty offensive line when he came in. They were kind of splitting work to start. And it, I don't know, it just didn't come together. But I feel like he has, it, he might take a very similar trajectory to what we saw Joe Mixon do, right? Like continuing to have that value because the upside is so high. So I'm happy taking him in there. And right after that, I'll go with uh, DeAndre Swift, who I think is, I still think he's probably the most talented back in this entire uh, in this entire group, and he was the second back off the board, right? It went Clyde Edwards, and then a couple picks later, Detroit took him at 35th overall. So it tells you that that's the guy that they want to invest in. When you're talking about a pure talent, it's DeAndre Swift up here and then on Johnson down here. Like, we all like on, right? But he's nowhere near the prospect that DeAndre Swift is. What I think, what I think we're going to be in store for is uh, right off the rip, it's definitely going to be a 50-50 timeshare. I'd imagine it's going to be a lot of carry-on. It's going to be a lot of Swift. I think they'll split carries. But I think they're going to get Swift really involved in the passing game. Like to the hopes that we thought Carry On was going to be involved last year, right? Catching 40, 50, 60 passes. I think we're going to see a lot of that from DeAndre Swift. Like um, Patricia's first year coming in, they had Theo Riddick, who saw like 80 targets. And then last year, they, they had no tar- they had no uh, no weapons in the passing game really outside of Galladay, right? Because Marvin Jones got hurt. They didn't have a pass catching running back. Their slot guy was like Danny Amendola, TJ Hawkins, who was hurt. So I think that the offense is going to be looking uh, a little bit different than it was last year. And uh, I just I, he's going to be in a committee, which is, which is what makes this pick tough. But if he can bust his way out, the talent that he has, he can put together seasons like Aaron Jones did despite being in a committee. You know, he has that sort of upside. I really believe in this kid's talent. Not the best landing spot, of course. And Carry On has two more years on his contract. He's got this year. They can cut him for next year, and they'll save like a million and a half. But really, doesn't make sense when you could just kind of keep him on the roster and have him for you know a two million dollar contract. So uh, I'd mm-hmm. imagine both of them will stick around. But like DeAndre Swift is just too talented that he's not going to put together a few games where he pops off for like one fifty and two touchdowns, and eventually will start creeping up the workload a little bit. So long term, the running back by committee is absolutely a uh, is a real concern, and that's probably why I pull him down to to the the fifth running back off the board for me. Yeah, I hope this team realizes like the sunk cost in, in carry on Johnson just hands over the reins to DeAndre Swift. But I just don't think that's in the cards like Nick said. But when you think about it and what Mike said earlier, a guy like Austin Eckler, who's going to touch the ball 12 to 15 times a game with his usage in the passing game, with his efficiency, he's a very valuable fantasy contributor. And the Lions offense isn't terrible, right? They do bring back Marvin Jones from injury. Hawkinson's back. They're going to hopefully be pretty efficient. And on those 12 to 15 touches, we could maybe expect DeAndre Swift to get. He's probably going to be very productive on those. And the OC there, Daryl Bevel, going through his history, he's always had a workhorse back. It was Adrian Peterson and Marshawn Lynch. But I would problem, assume that I, I what think, we saw. I think of, it's more Patricia's decision. That's why, like we like yeah. we like that we like that line a little bit last year for carry on. But it seems like Patricia's the yeah. one that keeps coming out and being like, we don't want to get our running backs hurt and shit, you know. But Be- Bevel will still, you know, call the plays to make sure that it's a lot of like his running backs do stay very involved. And in the beginning of 2019, carry on was actually getting a pretty decent workload. He was averaging 19.2 touches per game before getting injured. But that's the issue. He just keeps getting injured. 
I would expect if he's used in a smaller load, like eight to 10 touches a game, he's going to be able to stay healthy, which isn't great for DeAndre Swift's upside. But I think what Nick said, being used heavily out of the backfield, like Theo Rick was catching a ton of passes when he used to play there. DeAndre Swift doesn't tip the offense's, offense's hand like a Theo Riddick does. So he's going to be able to be out there on the early downs as well as third down. And his talent is just way too good to pass up on. We learned this lesson from last year with AJ Brown, like, sometimes talent overrides situation and i know running backs it's a little bit different because of how offensive coordinators and coaches want to use them and the amount of touches that they get but he's just way too good of an all-around running back and even in somewhat of a timeshare at georgia he was still extremely dominant so yeah i i can't disagree with this pick here let me let me yeah. ask you guys this is uh something i brought up in my individual video video yesterday so I would imagine, where do you guys think Swift and Dobbins are going to go in redraft leagues? Probably like fifth round, right? Mm, probably, yeah. Like, that's usually where rookie running backs go that aren't. Yeah, like, like fourth, fifth know, round where people best. make up this like imaginary upside that, that's probably not actually there for a, a long time <laughs> into the season. I was thinking about yep. like them two remind me, or I think they're in almost identical situations to Kareem Hunt, who's probably going to be like a seventh or eighth round pick because they're all three of them are talented. All three yep. of them are going to be in running back by committees. All three of them have good standalone value, but elite handcuff value. So I would argue that like those three should probably be in a tier together. And whoever goes the last of them, because none of them are guaranteed goal line work. Uh, all of them will be pluses in the receiving game, but none of them are giving you the upside that you want, you know, given their talent. So uh, like I, I like kind of pairing those three together and seeing who goes latest and then probably shooting at, at that one. Yeah, I'd say like, um, sorry, you, you said it was Dobbins, Akers, and Swift. Those, no, those no, three? no, Dobbins, Swift, and Kareem Hunt. Oh, okay, yeah. I think um, I think Dobbins would actually like fall a little bit out from that group and redraft for me. Probably. Uh, just because uh, you're not getting target volume there. Like, like, like Mark Ingram is a pretty good pass catcher. Like when he's with the Saints, he was pretty heavily involved in the pass game. When you go to like the Ravens, like Lamar just doesn't throw, man. He's yeah. not looking to dump off. He's looking to take off and run in the last, the third down. So I'd say I put him a little bit lower, but I'd say Swift and Kareem Hunt are very, very comparable. And I think if we look back to carry on's first year, that's the type of role you're going to see where like he gets 150 to like 160 touches, but you're looking at like 60 to like four targets a game. I think, I think that's what I think. I think Kareem Hunt's going to go like two rounds later than DeAndre Swift yeah. is in redraft leagues too. And I think it's like the perfect play to go off these rookie running backs who are awesome in dynasty. Like obviously you want them in dynasty, but redraft is going to be tough. And you're right, dude. Cause like you look back at carry on's rookie year, dude, do you remember that the first half of the year, like Garrett Blunt was averaging 2.7 yards per carry and had yeah. more carries to the halfway point. Like Matt Patricia yeah. is a dumb motherfucker, yo. And he's going to do that again this year with Swift, no matter how talented the guy is. He just doesn't trust one running back, which is what kind of scares me because we don't know how long that, that that's going to play itself out for, you know? Yeah. All right. Yeah, and in those situations, you would think like the 35th overall pick means that they're going to use him as a workhorse, but you never really know with Matt Patricia. I mean, like, it doesn't was a really... second rounder too, you know? So it's like... <laughs> Who fucking knows? Yeah. Good thing neither of them is like fat enough to take food off the other one's plate. But uh, at the 108, I'm going to go with Jalen Rager, my wide receiver one. I believe he's Mike's wide receiver one and Nick's wide receiver two. He was my wide receiver one heading into this whole thing. So it wasn't he wasn't really going to move back for me unless it was a bad landing spot. So the fact that he landed in Philadelphia, a place where his skill set matches perfectly to that situation, he couldn't have moved back for me. Carson Wentz has been looking for somebody to throw the ball deep down the field to for so long. And I actually read Max's article and there was like these stats about how he can't throw deep down the field to the right. And Jalen Rager runs to the right a lot. Mm -hmm. We also thought AJ Brown was only a slot receiver and then he dominated in the NFL on the outside. So I'm not sure how much I weigh that. But you look at what Carson Wentz has had on the outside. It's been Nelson Aguilar. It's been Torrey Smith. And it was Deshaun Jackson for about like 53 snaps last year. And he's always been peppering that part of the, uh, the field. He actually was seventh in deep ball attempts last year. He was outside the top 10 in accuracy, but he didn't really have anybody of note trying to catch those passes. So I think his ability to win deep down the field and them not really having anybody aside from Deshaun Jackson occupying that role. And at this point of his career, he's I don't think you can ever trust Deshaun Jackson on a week to week basis. Uh, Zach Ertz, Goddard, Miles Sanders open up things underneath for Jalen Rager to not get double teamed as little as that actually happens in the NFL. Like He's going to be able to command the wide receiver one role there in his rookie year. What does that really mean? I don't think he's going to be a guy that flirts with like 120 targets, but I think the efficiency that he brings to the table with his deep ball ability to win in contested situations, along with what he can do after the catch, I just think that his talent is fantastic. His landing spot is great. The draft capital is there. Everything meshed for him to be and continue to be my wide receiver one for Dynasty. Love, love, love 
Jalen fucking Rager, okay? This was like when we were on the live stream, we talked about this. And after we saw the landing spots for CD, Ruggs, and Jerry Judy, I'm like, hey, if if, if Rager goes to Philly, it is going to be the dream matchup for him because Carson Wentz throws a pretty beautiful deep ball and they need a deep threat to open up that offense. So, I mean, I think I'm still like debating between CD Lamb and Rager because I love CD Lamb that much. Dude, you got to go but, CD, bro. I'm telling but, you, you're um, going to regret it in a couple of years. Don't do it, Mike. Don't listen to him. Yeah, yeah. But, but like, honestly, like, you just, I don't think you can go wrong between these two receivers. And just like how we had two running backs in the first tier, I have two wide receivers in the first tier and, and it's going to be Jalen Rager's in one of them. So, love that spot. Next up, my pick. So just talked about him, but I'm going to go CD Lamb here uh, with my 109. And it's fucking crazy that we can conceivably land a player like CD Lamb at the 109 because in most other drafts, like he would have to be the first wide receiver off the board pretty easily and probably go in the top four to five, right? So now you're getting him in the back half of the back half of the first. And I think a lot of people are scared off by his landing spot because they have Mario Cooper, they have Michael Gallup, yada, yada, yada. But first of all, it's a really high passing volume offense. And again, I just go back to the moniker of good players make other good players better. And so CeeDee Lamb going there and being with Cooper is a good thing. I don't see it as a bad thing. Cooper is potentially gone in 2021 with very little uh, dead cap hit. And at the end of the day, like if I had to pick between two wide receivers, I'm going to pick CeeDee Lamb. Like I think this is a really, it's not... I don't know if it's really bad, but I think it's pretty bad for Michael Gallup's long-term prospects. But as far as CD Lamb's concerned, like I'm all on, I'm all on board. Let me ask you, where if 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 CD Lamb came out last year, and you didn't know how any of the rookies played out in 2019, like you didn't know Josh Jacobs was going to do good and Jaws was going to suck and shit, where do you think you would have drafted CD Lamb in rookie drafts last year? I would have drafted him right where I drafted Nikhil Harry, which is right after Josh Jacobs. I think I would have taken. I think I would have been ignorant enough to like watch him, like his film, and taken him. I think he would have been on one on one last year. Uh, I, yeah, I, I mean really that's do. like not even argument. Yeah, that wouldn't even. Realistically, be a, I think he would have been my three behind AJ Brown and Nikhil Harry. Obviously, looking back, Nikhil shouldn't be in that conversation, but I think <laughs> all three of them were like really good prospects. And obviously, CD Lamb is a fantastic prospect for him to go 17th overall to a team that already has two established receivers. Just speaks to how good he is. And I think that they took him to kind of get payback on the Dallas Goddard pick by Philly and take away the receiver that Philadelphia wanted. Yo, what do you guys like what do you guys think that says about Michael Gallup though? The fact that they took someone like that early even though it wasn't a need? Uh I, I think that says anything. Dropped a fuck ton of balls. He did, he did drop a ton of passes, but that's pretty random. I'm not too worried about that, but it, like to me it's like it's like yo, like you're not you're not that dude because we want this guy. You know what I mean? Yeah, I think I I I'm not sure it says so much about Michael Gallup as it just does about CD Lamb the prospect. I just think it was they were just like, you know, let's strengthen a strength here. Let's not fucking look for our holes. Let's just go all in on what we're doing best for our for our offense. And I think between Kel Moore and Mike McCarthy, it's just like there's not gonna be enough targets to go around. And the other point too, uh John Daigle was tracking the vacated targets and air yards for Roto World and Dallas the Dallas Cowboys actually had the second most vacated targets available going into this year. Uh, with 190 between Witten leaving, Jason uh, Randall Cobb leaving and shit. CD's going to put up some numbers this year, man. He really is, I think. I think uh, I don't think 80 to 90 targets is out of the realm of possibilities for his rookie year. And with his yak ability, I think he could turn that into something pretty impressive. And we're all, I mean, he'll he'll overtake Michael Gallup before long and then be competing with Amari before long as well for the wide receiver one role. And this is a good, this is a quarterback that you're going to want to be tied to for, for a long time. So uh, CD here, I absolutely love it. Yeah, yep. Nick, you said you expect like 90 to 100 targets, and you might be like, oh, I want 100 or whatever. Who led rookie receivers last year in targets? Wasn't it DK Metcalf with like 90 on the dot? Like these guys, yeah. if they're good, they're going to be able to produce. In this offense, it doesn't take a lot to be able to produce and be efficient, especially when you're surrounded with Amari Cooper and Michael Gallup and Ezekiel Elliott. Things just start to get easier for you. It's going to be an easy transition for C.D. Lamb, who we all think is a fantastic receiver in his own right. So it's it should be all wheels up for C.D. Lamb, especially with all those vacated targets. Yeah, what did Randall yep. Cobb put up last year? Randall Cobb put up like... He, he had like 840 yards. Yeah, he had like 80, 80 targets for like 800 yards. Yeah, like 15 games, 83 targets, 828 yards. Yeah, so like, if, C, if C.D. hits that number, which I fully accept him to do because he's better than Randall Cobb is... His his price is gonna fucking skyrocket. It's, yeah, it's gonna. That's like a little bit less than what Terry did in his rookie year. Yeah, chill. Yeah, it wasn't, but. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay. Uh, next up. Uh, so I think out of us, I think you guys still have Jerry Judy here, but uh, I actually moved Jeff Justin Jefferson into my wide receiver three uh, the other day, and 
you know, just comes from like the landing spot. I actually, initially, I thought like you know maybe this is not so hot because he has to share the slot with Thielen. But I think you put out the tweet right, Nick, that Adam Thielen basically played only what like thirty percent of his snaps. Yeah, thirty-one percent of his snaps. I don't know if that was because they went more two tight end sets and that, and like you know there's no real slot receiver there, but it's still yeah. not like the sixty to seventy he was playing the year prior. So yeah, and, and like if anything, like. It's, it w- I would be more inclined to believe that they're going to make the job a little bit easier for the rookie versus the veteran Adam Thielen. Yeah. So, and Justin Jefferson was fucking dominant in college from the slot. So we we're going to absolutely love to see that. And more so just like there's just a lot less competition there. Uh, maybe it's a lower passing volume, even though I'm not even sure because Denver is probably one of the top, uh, the bottom 10 pass heavy offenses in the league. So uh, I just really like the spot and, you know, I like the talent a lot on Jefferson as well. So kind of why I went there. Yeah, and I don't think you should just, like, make it a cookie-cutter mold that, like, Justin Jefferson can only play in this slot. I know you weren't trying to do that, Mike, but, like, he played on the outside in his sophomore year, and that was his breakout season. And obviously he did a ton better this year playing in the slot, but he was the whole offense as a whole, like, was dominant this year. So you can't really just say he's not good on the outside. And on top of that, Adam Thielen, a little bit earlier in his career, was playing on the outside while Stephon Diggs was in the slot in his rookie year. So I could see a kind of like a 50-50 split between the two. And I think with just how good Justin Jefferson is after the catch and also in like jump ball and contested situations, it, it won't really matter if he's playing on the outside. They're going to manufacture him touches like they did with Stephon Diggs to win after the catch. And what you want in fantasy football are guys that can win after the catch, like an A.J. Brown did in his rookie year, like a Debo Samuel. Justin Jefferson fits that mold in an offense that is devoid of targets because uh, or lost targets because Stephon Diggs went to the Buffalo Bills. So there's going to be opportunity there. And we've seen a guy with a, sim- a similar skill set produce over the past four or five years there. So uh, I love this pick. The fact that you can get a receiver with this type of landing spot at the 110 it is, uh, I think. Yep, 110. Uh, it, it's crazy. I'm going to go with who yeah, Mike passed on. I'm going to go with Jerry Judy. You fucking He is somebody who... <laughs> <laughs> Take your boy. You made... Take your fucking boy. I don't have a boy, man. Only Tom Telesco does. Josh uh, Kelly. <laughs> Christ, this whole draft is going to fucking be the end of me. Uh, Jerry Judy. Uh, he lands in Denver, and you may not think that there's a ton of targets there, and there really isn't. But Pat Shermer is now in town, so it's a different offensive scheme. And you look through his history when he's had two good receivers to use. He was in Minnesota in 2016 and 2017. 2016 was Stephon Diggs' rookie year and Adam Thielen's breakout year. Both went over 900 yards, and Diggs only played 13 games. Then the year after that, Diggs went for 849 and 8 touchdowns, and Adam Thielen had 1,200 yards and 4 touchdowns. They do add KJ Hamler. They do have Noah Fant. They did add Albert O. They have a decent stable of running backs. Philip Lindsay's really good. Melvin Gordon kind of dips that down, but I digress. I just think (laughs) that Jerry Judy, you can argue, is the most talented receiver in this receiving group, even more so than Cortland Sutton, if you're going to argue on that, whatever. Uh, But I think just the way he was picked in the top 15 and the talent that he has and what he did at Alabama, despite competing with Devonta Smith, Jalen Waddell, uh, Henry Ruggs, who isn't even good. I just think (laughs) that talent's going to win out here. They're going to pepper him with targets. He's going to play the Emmanuel Sanders to that DT role. And Emmanuel Sanders was there in the beginning of the year, and he had a pretty he had a few pretty good performances. It's a different offensive system. I just don't think you pick a guy that plays such a good complementary role to Cortland Sutton as early as he was picked and not use him in your offense. Here, here's the the way I look at it, too. And so, sometimes as, as fantasy analysts, you know, we get very wrapped up in numbers and stuff. And I try to pull myself out of that sometimes and look at, like, what they're doing from a football sense. And, it's you know, we were talking about the last dance. like, And I, I like hearing shit from, like, GMs and, and execs point of views about how they're building a team right they're like oh we're building this team so that we could beat this team right like we know that these are the guys that we're gonna have to beat if we ever want to win a championship denver's in the same division as the Chargers. yes that's what i was i was literally <laughs> waiting for you to fucking insert that they're in the same division as kansas city that's what they're doing it's why they use so many dude look at their picks speed speed receiving receiving speed it's Hamler, it's Judy, it's Albert O. Like, there's no fucking reason to draft Albert O unless you're just sending fucking Noah Fan Albert <laughs> O on the scene. They want to compete with Kansas City. This offense is going to take a 180-degree fucking spin around in what their game plan is going to be under Pat Shermer. They're not going to be a big run-heavy team anymore. I guarantee you they let Drew Locke unlock. I don't know why I like, just threw that Damn. fucking sentence in there. I didn't mean to, and it just took, took my brain into a fucking blender. But they're going <laughs> to unlock Drew Locke, and they're going to let him pass the ball a shit ton. Which means, like, you know, Judy might be the second, third target in the offense, whatever you think he's going to be. But the volume 
in that offensive pass attempts is going to go up because they they the only way to beat the, you're not going to ground and pound the Chiefs to death. It just ain't going to happen because Mahomes is going to score fucking 38 points a game. Pass heavy, unlock the lock. Animal, you didn't hear this from me. Yeah, I mean, like if you think about the last year, I think Denver has tried the uh, ground and pound defensive uh, maneuvering, and what ends up happening is they go out and they shut down Mahomes for two half, two a half, maybe three quarters, and then Mahomes just like lets loose because every single coach plays like plays not to lose. All the defensive coaches they play not to lose and they stop blitzing and they stop doing that, and Mahomes just fucking picks you apart. So I think teams are realizing now that like the best defense is just a good offense because you have to score and just keep them off the field. It's literally the only way to beat them. Yeah, so you could argue that Judy makes you know is going to be in a crowded group, but like if he's the best player there, then that's good because the volume is going to be there for whoever who you know whoever rises to the top, whoever the cream is in the coffee is going to be the one that gets drank. What a fucking analogy right there. All right, 112. 112, this is the last pick of the first round. Now I'm debating, and again, the uh, rounds two through four are going to be in the draft guide exclusive. So if you've uh, enjoyed it up to this point, make sure you hit that thumbs up and go cop the draft guide at bigdogsdraftguide.com. The 112, I'm debating between a few guys here. I'm debating between Justin Herbert, who is you know the number six overall pick. So in a super flex league, it feels like you almost kind of need to take him here. I'm looking at Keyshawn Vaughn. I'm looking at Denzel Mims. I mean, there's also T. Higgins and Henry Ruggs, even if if that's your cup of tea. There's a lot to like, man. This class is just ridiculously stacked yeah. at the top here. Uh, okay, so realistically, I don't want to take Herbert here uh, unless I need a quarterback. So if I'm pretty set at quarterback, if I have, you know, a good quarterback one, like a top 18 quarterback two, and then maybe like a, a 25 through 28 quarterback three, I'm likely not going to take Herbert here. I'm probably going to shoot for whatever my team needs. And I think I'll probably lean with uh, Keyshawn Vaughn here. He goes to Tampa Bay in the third round. And if you look at Tampa Bay's backfield, I mean, it's Ronald Jones, it's Dare, Abu Nguale, right? Whatever. Tom Brady is the yeah. quarterback there. And they need someone who can protect his ass. And I think Arian wants to use one running back. I, I, I am hesitant that... I think Vaughn is probably riskier than people are acknowledging now that he's going to be like a consensus first uh, first round pick in rookie drafts. But I think the upside is there. I think the upside of like a workhorse, in a sense, is um, is there to warrant the first round capital. I mean, he's got the size, right? 5'10", 215, uh, 74th percentile, weight adjusted speed score, which is one of the more predictive stats in fantasy football. So he's got a lot of things that you admire, and he also caught the ball pretty well. Uh, during his time at Vanderbilt, did it in the SEC and had, you know, relatively good efficiency and production on the ground in a very tough conference. So I think Vaughn is low key. Um, he dropped out of the complete first tier of running backs, obviously, but he's probably the next best, best thing when you're coming to fantasy. And, you know, we like to use our first round picks on running backs because you get instant plug and play uh, production. I do think there's going to be a little bit of a uh, little bit of a committee here, probably with Ronald Jones there. I mean, Ronald Jones is younger than Keyshawn Vaughn is right now. And it's not like Ronald Jones was bad, but it's not like someone that I think you just completely kind of cast off and he's a nothing to next year, right? We saw them use like a Peyton Barber and Ronald Jones committee last year with Dare. So I wouldn't really be surprised if we saw that same thing again a little bit this year. But Vaughn has the upside to take over the second half of the season. That's the way I look at it. In an offense that should be good and pass a lot less than they did last year, run the ball a lot more than it did last year. Yeah, and even if the overall volume isn't there for Keyshawn Vaughn out of the gate, I think he's going to get those valuable touches. A guy like Dare Ogumbawale, like he completely tips the offense's hand. They're not running the ball when he's out there. Keyshawn Vaughn can run, and he can catch passes. He caught 28 last year at Vanderbilt. And uh, if you look at Peyton Barber last year, he le he opens up 170 total opportunities. He had, I think, 18 receptions and like 152 rushes, something like that. Um, and he also leaves behind eight goal line rushes. Ronald Jones only had two last year. He did convert both of them. But Keyshawn Vaughn fits that bigger mold, and he was productive last year. He can break off big plays. I think he's going to fit into a role where he catches passes. He's on the goal line. He has somewhat breakaway speed. He's not a guy that's like a complete burner, but for as much as we want Ronald Jones to be that guy, Keyshawn Vaughn was actually faster than him at the combine at a bigger frame. So uh, I think he fits what Arians wants. Like you're not going to draft Keyshawn Vaughn in the early third round if he's not a good pass blocker because you would have just kept Ronald Jones at that price. 
And you bring in Tom Brady, you're not going to bring in a guy who can't protect him when the other guys in that offense can't do it either. So I like his skill set. I liked him prior to the draft, and I think that landing spot really helped him out. I have no problem taking him at the end of the first round, and I think it's realistic that you can get him in the early second because in most leagues, I think Justin Herbert is going to go a little bit earlier than the 112 even. All right. I also want to – sorry to uh, cut you off there, Mike, but I just saw an article I thought was really interesting that we can touch on for a little bit. One other thing I want to bring up once we get to the – later part of the video is maybe touching on some guys that could be possible uh, multi-position players in fantasy football, right? Some guys that are like hybrid players that might be listed in multiple positions. So that's something you could take advantage of for sure in, in fantasy. And I think it might move their value up or down depending on which way they're, they're shifting. But I just saw an article from NBC and Vegas put up the sports book odds for offensive rookie of the year. Now, Joe Burrow is at plus 215, which is actually surprising. I figure he would be like way higher than that. Mm-hmm. Next on the list, above Tua, above Herbert, above all the quarterbacks, Clyde Edwards Hilaire at 550. Wow. Jonathan Taylor at plus 1,000, Swift at 1,200, Judy at 14, Dobbins 16, Herbert 16, CeeDee Lamb 1,800, Ruggs 18, uh, Cam Akers 2,000, Rager 2,000. So that's, they have the full list, but everything goes down from there. So you have Burrow at 215, but Clyde Edwards is not that far off. And I really, the, What's going to happen is Clyde is going to end up scoring like 12 fucking touchdowns this year, and you're you're going to have no choice but to be like, even if he wasn't that good, even if he puts up like 1,100 yards, he's just going to score so much because that's what Kansas City does behind Mahomes. So, I don't know. I just thought that was interesting. That's interesting. Is that Sorry, is that rookie of the year or offensive rookie of the year? Yeah, offensive rookie of the year. Okay, yeah. That's interesting. Did, did Kamara win offensive rookie of the year? No, he didn't, right? But who won offensive rookie of the year that year? Uh, was he in a Kareem Hunt's class? Oh, yeah, he was. That's right. So it would have been a career hunt. What an unbelievable class that was for running backs. Yeah, it's crazy that this one's going to be even better. At least the top. Yeah, a lot of the guys that broke out in that class. Were no, like, it was Kamara. It was Kamara. Kamara won? Yeah, Kamara won that year in wow. 2017. So. That's wild. Okay. So there you go, man. And he he play, he can play that easily, easily the Kamara role, right, in a top-notch offense. And the key is he's on a team that wins, right? And then when you, when you win more, you get a higher profile, you probably get that vote. So that makes a lot of sense. Yeah, it does. All right, so let's uh, – I'm going to wrap up the, the first round real quick. So we had Clyde Edwards at 101, Jonathan Taylor 102, Burrow 103, Tua 104, Dobbins 105, Akers 106, DeAndre Swift 107, Rager, CeeDee Lamb, Justin Jefferson, Jerry Judy – Keyshawn Vaughn to wrap up the 12 picks in the first round if this was a one quarterback league I know I think we talked about it over the weekend a few times I'm probably not touching a quarterback in that first round I think the responsible thing to do because this is such a deep class is probably start to look at Burrow in the earlier second round maybe around like somewhere from I I would say like the 202 or like the 204 maybe is like the earliest you could probably start looking at those guys but this is not a class that I think you you dip into the first round to um to grab a quarterback in yeah Yeah, and to that point like would you rather have the seventh best running back in this class and the eighth best receiver or the best quarterback in this class even if it's one qb leagues like i would just much rather have joe burrow than a michael pittman yeah i think that that's where it goes borderline it depends who would fall to you at like the 203 or 204 in some leagues like vaughn will fall down there in some leagues justin jefferson will fall down there so that that's going to be a case-by-case basis but the point is like that's probably the area where you're going to start looking at those guys but it'll probably be broken down by uh, by tiers and you can find our rankings and stuff like that in the draft guide again big dog draft guide.com if you want to check out rounds two through four which we're about to film right after this um you can go check that out that'll be up wednesday so today as you're watching this that'll already be in the draft guide again if you enjoyed the video hit that thumbs up make sure you're following noah make sure you're following mike and myself on the twitter uh thank you all for sticking around so that's it for today peace